Thank you, Brother Tim. Thank you, Brother Tony. The music was beautiful. <clears throat> we're going to start today in the book of Luke, chapter 2. We'll be in the book of Luke, chapter 2, for the majority of the message, but then we're going to flip over to 2 Corinthians for just a, a brief period of time. So if you want to go ahead and open your Bibles to Luke, chapter 2. <clears throat> We will be towards the end of Luke chapter 2. I'm going to start reading in verse 41. But before we get there, I, I do have a, a short story to share with you. Uh, you guys know that I love kids. Uh, uh, and, and, and usually when service is over, I'm, I'm chasing Kyle and Elizabeth around in the foyer. And, and, and I, I've heard a few comments that, you know, I'm going to run into somebody or, you know, you don't want me to break myself, but but uh, I, I love kids, and, and this, is one of the, this is one of the reasons why I love kids. Kids are just, they're completely honest. They really are. Uh, when, when things get back to normal and you're standing at the back door and you're shaking everybody's hands as you go out, like you can ask the kids, you know, was the service good? And they'll tell you exactly what they think. They will. Uh, and, and here's a little bit of a warning. Sorry, we, we are recording this. I'm supposed to stay in a certain section here. This is a little bit of a warning for the parents here. Like they will also tell me what their parents think. They will. So uh, th this is one of those incidents where, like, you know, you're, you're out there. And when I was growing up, we would, we would always go to shake the preacher's hand, and he would always reach into his pocket, and he'd give us a piece of hard candy and shake our hands. So we loved shaking the preacher's hands after church. And, and, and this is one of those times when I'm doing that, and the, and the poor little kid comes up, and, and, and he says, Preacher, he says, when I get older, I'm going to give you some money. And I thought, well, that's okay. That's, that's, that's kind of you. I said, but, but why, why would you say that? He says, well, my daddy said, you're the poorest preacher he's ever heard. <laughs> Happy Father's Day. <clears throat> we're going to begin reading in Luke chapter 2. Before we begin reading in Luke chapter 2, I, I'm going to ask that we just bow our heads and pray for, for God to bless his services. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you, dear Lord, for giving us an opportunity to come together. And, and thank you, dear Lord, for allowing us to smile and laugh and enjoy the company of each other. Continue to bring us together, Lord. Continue to grow our fellowship and continue, dear Lord, to use us to do great and mighty works in this community for your name. Amen. Okay, so Luke chapter 2, I'm going to begin reading in verse 41, and I want to let you know this is not a new passage in Scripture. There are no new passages in Scripture, so I expect that most of you have heard this particular story before. So it's not the story that I think is, is going to be new to you. It's going to be, I'm going to ask you to actually think about the story, and I'm going to ask you to think about the story in reference to what is it that Jesus is trying to reveal to us in his written word in this particular story. And I enjoy this particular story, I really do, because this gives us a glimpse of what you would consider to be the perfect family. The perfect family as recorded in Scripture. And I love that because the perfect family as recorded in Scripture is hilarious. It just really is. So we're going to begin reading in Luke chapter 2, and we start in verse 41. <clears throat> His parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. Now, this, is, this tells us a lot. This really does. It's, I'm not just dropping you in the middle of the story here. His parents went to Jerusalem every year for the feast of the Passover. That's, that's the equivalent of saying his parents went to church. That's the equivalent of saying his parents were Christians. In this instance, they're Jewish. So this is the equivalent of saying that the parents had some care and concern in their hearts for the things of God, and they were teaching that to their children. How do we know they're teaching it to their children? You go to verse 42. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem according to the custom of the feast. So when he's 12 years old, he's going with them up to Jerusalem. Why is he going there? He's going for the feast. He's going for the Feast of Passover. The Feast of Passover was, was that tradition in the Jewish culture that was supposed to be continued to remind them of their freedom from slavery, uh, of their freedom from Egypt when God had set them free. And the tenth plague was the death angel, and the death angel did not 
visit any of the Jewish households if they had obeyed the word of God, if they had taken the lamb and they had put some of the blood of the lamb on the doorpost, then the death angel would pass over. So, so here we are in, in the first century, thousands of years after the Passover, and, and we see that the Jewish family, this particular Jewish family, is still honoring the tradition that God had said they were supposed to honor. Now that's really key for fathers here, it really is. It's Father's Day message, so dads, guess what? I'm, I'm, I'm aiming for your toes. Ladies, I will get to yours later. See, it's not just that mom and dad were taking part in the feast, but mom and dad were teaching the children to take part in the feast. That's the equivalent of your preacher today saying your kids should be in church. Drum roll, no drummer. Thank you, sir. I'm not there yet. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not, the, not the point of the message. So this one's filled with like a subtext. It really is. This message is going to be crazy. So in, in today's message, look right here in verse 42, and when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem according to the custom of the feast. Now, if, you've, if you recognize this story, this is actually Jesus who was 12 years old and was going with Joseph and Mary. So this is why I say we're talking about the perfect family because in this particular instance, you remember that, like, that Mary was, was so precious to God that, that she was chosen out of all of the women to have Jesus and in that particular context if God is sending his son to a particular woman then he also knows who that woman's father that woman's husband is going to be so in this particular instance what you have here is you have the first family of Christianity you have a family that was picked by God to raise his child Jesus the perfect family and every year they're going up for the feast. And when Jesus is of age, they bring him with them. And, and this, is, this is really key because in the modern world, it lets us know that the things of God are supposed to be important to the fathers. And that the things of God are supposed to be passed on to the children. Far too often in, in today's world, in the modern world, in New Colony, when I visit with families and I ask, okay, what about your kids? They say, well, we don't want to influence our kids. We want them to make their own choices. Allowing your kids not to have an opportunity to get to know Christ is influencing your children. And it's influencing them in the wrong way. <clears throat> Verse 43. And when they had finished the days, as they returned, the boy Jesus lingered behind in Jerusalem. I love this. You guys, do you see what's happening here? You know the story, right? When they had finished the days, as they returned, the boy Jesus lingered behind them in Jerusalem. I'm going to continue reading in verse 43. And Joseph and his mother did not know it. They left town and they left Jesus behind. And, and I really have to take a moment here and smile because have you ever done that with your kids? I mean, not like left town without them, but I, I was freaked out when I was carrying Connor and Faith in a little child carrier because we would always come up to the car or the truck and we would set the child carrier on the car or the truck and then we would get into the car or we would pull the seat up and then we would put the kids in. And I always worried that someday I was going to actually forget to put the kids in and drive off and they would just slide off the roof. Was I the only person that worried about that? Okay. That's not what happened. But here, remember, we're talking about Mary who was picked specifically by God to raise his son, Jesus. And Joseph, who was picked by God to be Mary's husband. And, and this was the perfect family that God had picked to raise their child. And they had taken him and they had raised him in the ways of God. And they had taken him to the feast of Passover. And then they left town without him. <laughs> and, and really and truly, think about the mode of travel. They didn't get into a car and just drive away. Like they were walking or they were riding a camel. Those are their two options. That's it. So if you're walking and you have a 12-year-old, you can see him. If you're walking and you don't see your 12-year-old, don't you kind of wonder where he's at? Like you remember how, how mischievous the kids were when they were 12? 
You didn't want to leave them alone in a room because you knew something was going to get broken, right? In this particular instance, both Mary and Joseph had been there in town. They had made sure that Jesus had come with them. And then when they got ready to leave, they just left. The perfect family were pretty terrible parents when you think about it. Which should give all the fathers in this room a sigh of relief, like, whew. Because I know that we hold ourselves to a standard where we want our kids to think that we don't ever make any mistakes. I know that we do that as parents. I know we do. But Mary and Joseph made mistakes. I mean, let's be honest. They left town. And it gets a little worse. I'm going to read a little further. But point number one of today's message. Point number one really was children need to learn about Jesus. And, and, and think about this. This is God who's left heaven to be born a child, to be raised in an earthly family. And even he needed to learn about the things of God. Mary and Joseph were, responsible, were supposed to, were responsible for teaching him. They were responsible for taking him to the feast. They were responsible for teaching him these things. And if Mary and Joseph, the perfect family, are supposed to be responsible for teaching their kids, then ladies and gentlemen, it's a pretty strong biblical case here that we are now responsible for teaching our kids. We are responsible for teaching our kids. Continue in verse 44. This is where it starts to get worse. But supposing him to have been in the company, they went a day's journey and sought him among their relatives and acquaintances. But supposing him to have been in the company, they went a day's journey and sought him among their relatives and their acquaintances. And I love the order that they put that in. They traveled for an entire day, and then they said, Oh, wait, I haven't seen Jesus in a little while. Let's go find the rest of the family and see where he's at. So then they found the rest of the family, and Jesus wasn't with them. And now they're freaking out. They're going, Oh, my goodness, if he's not with the family, where's he at? So they went to check the acquaintances acquaintances really you left your 12 year old you've traveled an entire day and now you're freaking out because you can't find him he's not with your husband he's not with his he's not with your wife or however you're thinking of it then you go to your cousins and you go to your uncles and you go to your grandparents and you can't find your son anywhere and they say okay well we've ruled out all of the family let's check everybody else that's acquaintances let's check everybody else they have no idea where their 12-year-old son is. And it gets worse than this, verse, 40, verse 45. So they did not find him. They returned to Jerusalem seeking him. Think about that day's walk. Because think about it. They, they've traveled an entire day, and they haven't found their son. And now they start looking for him, and they can't find him in any places that he should be. So they check the places that he shouldn't be. They can't find him in the places that he should be. They can't find him in the places that he shouldn't be. So now they're walking an entire day back to town thinking, where did we leave our son? And let's just be honest. The perfect parents are probably looking at you. They're going, well, I thought he was with you. No, I thought he was with you. They had to walk an entire day's journey back to town. And this was, not, this was not a small town. They were going to Jerusalem. They were going to the place that everyone had just went for the feast of the Passover. It's like going to New Orleans for Mardi Gras, but different. It was a different type of parade. Let's just say it like that. But everybody went. So now everybody's going back. And in this particular instance, think about this. They made that day's journey out of town. The feast is over, so everybody's headed back towards their house. They're making that day's journey back into town. What do they tell all of those people that they pass as they're walking in the wrong direction? Everybody else is leaving town. As you're walking in, do you actually say, Oh, wait, did we miss it? Or do you say, Well, I lost my son. Which one's better? Oh, I'm a couple of days late, but I want to make my appearance. No, no, I lost my child. I got to go back and find him. And think about this. Every time you pass somebody, they're thinking, what are they going that way for? 
and they're all walking, so they have to walk past each other. Have you ever walked somewhere, and like you see somebody coming from a distance, and then like, okay, and then they keep getting closer and closer and closer, and you're not sure when you're supposed to say hi. You nod your head, hey. And they say, hey, what are you guys doing? Oh, we're, we're, we're leaving Jerusalem. What are you doing? Oh, we're, we're going back to Jerusalem. Really? What happened? <laughs> I lost my son. He's 12. I've misplaced him someplace. I don't know how your kids were growing up, but I have a Connor. <laughs> it could have happened. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> Love you, son. They had to walk an entire day's journey back. Verse 46. Now, so it was that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. Now, the second half of that verse we're going to get to in just a second, but that first half of the verse I want to park at for just a second. So now it was that after three days they found him. I want you to think about this. Does that mean three days total that they found him? Or does that mean they were back in Jerusalem for three days looking for him? Because if that's the case, they were a day's journey outside of town. They were a day's journey back into town. And then they spent three days looking for him. That's a total of five days. Have you ever tried not to feed your kids for a day? <laughs> Jacob, I'm... I'm <laughs> Even if it was just the three days, think about it from that particular perspective. For three days, you have no idea where your son is. And this was Mary's first child. Can you imagine how that's going to make her feel for the rest of the kids? We lost the first one. I don't know. Let's try again. It's okay to laugh. God has a sense of humor. I know he has a sense of humor because this is the perfect family that God picked to raise Jesus. And for three days, they didn't even know where he was. At least three days. I tend to fall on that five-day spectrum. I really do. Like they, they walked out of town for a day. They walked back into town for a day. And then they spent three days looking for him. And they found him. And I love how the Bible records the conversations that happen after they found him. Think about this. You haven't seen your son in three days. And you thought you had lost him. And you checked with all of your family and all of your friends and all of your acquaintances. And you walked all the way back into town. And then you spend some time in town and you can't find him. And they found him sitting in the temple in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. Verse 47. And all who heard him were astonished at his understanding and his answers. We need to really realize what's happening here. They found Jesus in the temple. And he was asking questions and he was answering questions. And scripture takes time to record for us that everybody who was listening was astonished at the things he was able to say. It, it doesn't say that his mother ran over and tackled him. It doesn't say that his dad grabbed the closest switch and said, boy, let me teach you a lesson. It says that they, they found him and they were astonished at the things that he was asking and the way he was answering questions. Verse 48. So when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said to him, Think about this, ladies. What's the first thing you're going to say to your son that you hadn't seen in three days that you lost? <laughs> Absolutely. Guys, what's the first thing you're going to say to your kids when they've been gone for three days and you've had to console your mother because you lost your child? <laughs> Nobody's going to admit it. Get over here! <laughs> Let's be honest, right? And you're going to tie something to him, and you're going to tie something to you so you can't lose him again, so then you, you, you know that you're going to be all right? When they saw him, they were amazed, and his mother said to him, Son, oh, went too far. Why have you done this to us? Look, your father and I have sought you anxiously. Son, 
Why have you done this to us? Whose fault is it they left him in town? Apparently, the 12 year old is responsible. Absolutely. So I love this. In the perfect family, remember, God picked Mary, God picked Joseph, and they're raising Jesus. And the first thing that Mary says, it ain't my fault. You know what that reminds me of? It's the first thing Adam said. <laughs> ain't my fault. 2,000 years later, when you go home later today and you're having an argument with your spouse, what's the first thing they're going to say? Ain't my fault. Do you guys do that? <laughs> one of them said yes. One of them said no. <laughs> there will be counseling later. It's okay. Think about this. This is the story of the, the perfect family raising the perfect child. And, and what does Mary say when she finds her son? Why have you done this to us? The 12-year-old's never in charge. The 12-year-old was not in charge 2,000 years ago, and the 12-year-old is not supposed to be in charge today. Let me repeat that. The 12-year-old is not supposed to be in charge today. At some point in this process, ladies and gentlemen, we need to understand that when God blesses us with children, they're our responsibility. We are not theirs. There, there takes some time of training and education to teach those children those things about God that they're supposed to learn. And when we do that, then we were able to raise them up and we're able to say, hey, you know what? I might have made a few mistakes, but I never lost my son for three days. Amen? <clears throat> Faith, we didn't lose you for three days either. I didn't lose my daughter. <clears throat> Verse 49. And he said to them, why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? What's the question that Mary has for her son after she hasn't seen him for at least three days? Why did you do this to us? What's his response? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? Clearly, very clearly in this instance... I'm just going to put this out there. This is Jesus preaching for the very first time. At the age of 12. Where did they find him? They found him in the temple. What did they find him doing? They found him asking questions and answering questions. What was the people's response? They were amazed at the way he could ask and answer these questions. What's Mary's response? Why did you do this to us? And he takes time at the age of 12 to remind Mary that he has a purpose in, for his life. Why did you seek me, he says. Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? He doesn't jump up and say, Oh, Mom, it's so good to see you. Oh, Dad, it's so good to see you. He doesn't say, Hey, you know what? It's been at least three days. Can you buy me some macaroni? No, that's not what he says. I knew Connor would smile at that one. It's okay. What does he say? He says, did you not know I must be about my father's business? And he's not talking about his earthly father. His earthly father was a carpenter. They didn't find him at a home building site. They found him in the temple. He's talking about his heavenly father. <coughs> Excuse me. He's talking about his heavenly father, and I really wanted to preach this particular message on Father's Day because i got to be honest with you guys. My dad died in a car wreck when I was two. I don't remember much of my dad. I don't. Because my dad died in a car wreck when I was two, when people would, would read things in Scripture as I'm at church and they would talk about their dads, my dad was never there. So I had a pretty poor image of what my father was, what my earthly father was. But for Father's Day, I think sometimes we need to be reminded that whether your dad is a good dad or whether your dad is a bad dad, whether you have a father in your life or whether you don't have a father in your life, which is kind of the norm now, you still have a heavenly father. You still have a heavenly father. And, and somebody needs to be teaching you about the things of your heavenly father. Because in this particular instance, we get to point number two of today's message. <laughs> God's children are supposed to be about God's business. 
So for Father's Day, this is a trend I would really love to see reversed. For Mother's Day, the sanctuary will be full with people who are attending church with their mothers. For Father's Day, the barbecue restaurants will be full for those kids taking their dads out for lunch. <clears throat> dads, I need you to teach your kids about the things of God, not the things of food. They'll learn that all on their, on their own. They really will. See, God's children are supposed to be about God's business. And that's what Jesus was saying. And I believe this was his first sermon that he had preached. And I believe that he was preaching it to those people who were closest in his life. So that teaches me something on Father's Day, that there's, there's this time in your life when you have to actually teach the people who are closest to you about the things of God, not the things of this world. Jesus didn't get bent out of shape that he was left in town. He went to work. Jesus, when he found his parents again, he, he wasn't overjoyed at the fact that he was now going to be going with his parents. No. He says, why were you even worried about me? Didn't you know I had to be about my father's business? And in, in that particular instance, Father's Day is really important for us because this is one of those things. Like we share all of the things that we love with our kids, whether they're good or whether they're bad. If you like to drink, you pass that on to your kids. If you like to work on cars, you pass that on to your kids. If you like to eat, you pass that on to your kids. But all of those things happen even if you're not trying. In order for your kids to learn about the things of God, there has to be some effort placed into it. What do I mean? you got to show up. Church has to be important to you. Sunday school has to be important to you. Reading the Bible has to be important to you. Having private time with you and God has to be important to you. Because if you don't make those things important to you, then your kids aren't going to pick them up. And God's children are supposed to be about God's business. We do a really good job of teaching them about the things of this particular world and not such a good job teaching them about the things of the next world where in all reality, they will spend the majority of their time. I'm not going to pick on Brother Pete, but I'm going to ask. 81 years went by pretty quick, didn't it? It does. You are, brother. No matter how much time you spend here, it's going to go by so quick. And then when you're gone, only those things that you did for God will have an eternal significance. If you save a ton of money and pass that on to your kids, I promise they will spend it. If you build a nice house and you, you, you pass that on to your kids, I promise you that they will wear it down. <laughs> If you buy a nice car and you pass that on to your kids, I promise you it's going to have a flat tire. The air conditioning is going to quit working, and the motor is going to go out eventually. Only those things that we do for God will have an eternal significance, and those are the things that we spend the least amount of time on. We will make sure that our kids know how to cook something because we want them to eat. We need to make sure that our kids understand they have a soul that lasts forever. We need to spend some time on Father's Day teaching our kids about the things of God. Why do we need to do that? Turn with me now to 2 Corinthians. In the Bible, to your right, turn the pages. Come on, I need to hear them going. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. When you get to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, go all the way down to verse 14. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14. For the love of Christ compels us, because we judge thus that if one died for all, then all died. 
I'm, I'm, I'm stopping right there before going to verse 15 because I want you to think about this for just a moment. Why are we supposed to tell our children about the things of God? Because the love of Christ compels us. Well, why does the love of Christ compel us to tell our children about the things of God? Because if one died for all, then all died. What is that? That's a biblical way of reminding you. You are not going to be here forever. This is not your permanent home. Yes, there are some things that we do here that may have a lasting effect, but only those things that we do for God will have an eternal lasting effect. All of the other things that we do here will eventually pass away. Build a great building and there's an earthquake and it falls down. Build a, a, a mass of wealth and, and then there's a stock market crash and it all disappears. For the love of God compels us that if one died for all, then all have died. Verse 15. And he died for all that those, that those who live should live no longer for themselves. We, we should no longer live for ourselves because Christ died to set us free from selfishness. Continuing in verse 15. But for him who died for them and rose again. And, and in this particular instance, I want to tell you that 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and Luke chapter 2 are a continuation of the same story. They're a continuation of that Father's Day story that, you know what, our Heavenly Father, who loves us so much, He left heaven that He could come to earth, that He could live the perfect example for us, that He could be raised in the middle of all of the chaos of this particular world, that He could suffer all of the things that we suffer, that He could be tempted in all of the ways that we are tempted, and yet He could remain true to His heavenly purpose, to our heavenly purpose, that He could remain true to living His life for the greater glory of His Father. And that's why we were created, so that we could... Bring glory to God. And then, and then when he died for us, he died to set us free. And when he rose, he rose for us so that we, we might know that we have the ability. You have the eternal destiny, not of death, but of resurrection. And the resurrection is going to be of one of two places. It's going to be of one of two things. You are going to be a child of God forever in heaven for eternity, or you're going to be a child of Satan forever in hell. And no matter what you do here or for how long you are blessed to be here, that choice remains true forever and ever and ever. That choice. So fathers, tell your children that when you're having lunch today lunch is nice i appreciate the shirt or the tie or whatever it is that you're going to get for father's day be thankful for it because you have children because children are a blessing but in that blessing there's also the responsibility and that responsibility is for us to teach them about the things of god so fathers don't neglect your responsibility for the youth that are here that don't have fathers earthly fathers anyway, you have a heavenly one. You have a heavenly one. You do. And he loves you so much that he wants to spend eternity with you. So he's put it down in writing. And if your dad's not teaching you, it's okay. You're still loved. Because not every father is going to accept the responsibility of doing what is right. They won't. And that's where the church comes in. That's why we're going to be praying for James as he goes off to the Navy to defend our country. Miss Peggy has a song picked out for us. Page 428 in your hymnals. Brother Virgil, would you come to the altar? Brother Virgil and I are not going to go to the back door to shake hands because some people are worried about the coronavirus. If you want to shake our hands, we will be, we will be here at the, the podium. We will. The altar is open if you want to come and pray. The church is open if you'd like to come and join in membership. But really and truly on this particular Father's Day, just know this. God, your heavenly Father, created you because he wants to have an eternal relationship with you.
that's your purpose.